Welcome to Pelicans Pregame Live, all brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. As we are in the courtside club tonight, alongside my partner, Antonio Daniels, Joel Myers, we get ready for the nine seed against the 10 seed as the Pels take on a division rival in the San Antonio Spurs, a team you know really well, and a team, don't forget, that AD won a title with back in 1999. So not only do you know the franchise well, you know the head coach very well, Greg Popovich. Yeah, so when we talk about the San Antonio Spurs, I think of two things. They have two stars. They got DeJounte Murray and they got Greg Popovich. <laughs> Good call. Because DeJounte Murray is a star, obviously an all-star in his own right, but they have a guy on the sideline that has a resume, cachet. You know he is accustomed to being in this atmosphere. This is nothing new for him. Right. You know, when you're talking about five championships, you're talking about sustained success for 20-plus years, Greg Popovich in the play-in game right now, you best believe he is going to have his team prepared for this environment that will be crazy tonight in the Smoothie King Center. Yeah, and as you bring it up, A.D., Greg Popovich, don't forget, took his team to the postseason a record 22 consecutive seasons. Now, they haven't been the last couple of years. Pels haven't been the last three years. But at the same time, Greg Popovich, not only the best coach in NBA history, but maybe the best at adjustments, mm. in-game adjustments. And we saw that at the Smoothie King Center in the last one where the Spurs won by four. They won at 107-103, and it was the second half when they went to the matchup 2-3 zone. Right, and that changed the entire game. That matchup zone changed the entire game because what, what you think when teams go to a matchup zone is because they can't defend you individually. Right. So they can't defend you in man-to-man. -man. And what Pop said is what we're going to do, we're going to junk this game up. You best believe we'll see a lot of that tonight. We will see a lot of the 2-3 zone tonight just to see how the Pelicans respond to it. And their response to that 2-3 zone, honestly, Joel, it could dictate the outcome. Now, let's also get into the fact that C.J. McCollum has joined this squad. Yes. They're a totally different team. In fact, the last 10 games when C.J. and Brandon Ingram have been on the floor for the Pels, they have gone 8-2. and two. C.J. McCollum has a ton of playoff experience, and that really has to help that locker room. It's, you know, when we talk about playoff experience, you talk to some people and they say, oh, you know what, it's overrated. I, I'm, I'm not one of those guys. Right. Call me old school. <laughs> Call me old school. I want... I want experience. I want someone who's battle tested. I want someone that's been there. I want someone that understands the magnitude of the moment. Right. CJ McCollum is that guy. You know, he's been to the Western Conference Finals. He's played in big time games, atmosphere games, like we'll see tonight. Again, we can't talk about how crazy, how wild, how amped up the amount of energy that is going to be in this arena tonight. When you're young and you're inexperienced, your nerves and your emotion can get the best of you. I say this all the time when we're talking about postseason. The moment that you pull up in the arena, the atmosphere is different. You right. feel it. I can't tell you what it is, but you feel the difference in postseason basketball as accustomed to the previous 82 games of the regular season. And I'm glad AD brought that up because also, don't forget, the loser of this game, it's the end of the season. So you win and you stay in, and you go and you match up with the LA Clippers. But if you lose, it's an abrupt ending, isn't it? We weren't talking about that today. No, but I'm just saying yeah, you've been yeah. in those situations oh. where you have to win yeah, so or it's over. You, you know what you hear a lot throughout the course of the season? You hear must win. When it's not a must win. <laughs> today <laughs> is a must win for both teams, obviously, right. because if you don't win, right. time to start making off-season plans. Yeah, and, and this team, by the way, is in a really good place. And we're gonna get into that as well because you were there today. I was at practice yesterday as well. And with CJ McCollum, Zion, by the way, was out there shooting uh, before the game tonight. He looks pretty good. He's not going to play, but he looked pretty good. And the best news, Brandon Ingram's all the way back from the hamstring. Now, let's pick up on the conversation that Willie Green, we're gonna go to that right now, had just a few minutes ago with the media. Zip. Pretty unique situation when you're in a one and done, Coach. I guess the other thing you would equate it to would be maybe a game seven. Is there any one statistic that you really need to get a hold of tonight that would be a big advantage to you? Just just be solid uh, more than anything and take care of the basketball, rebound the basketball, pretty simple. When you know an opponent so well, does it just come down to execution on both ends of the floor? Yeah, it does. We know what they're going to do. I'm sure they know what we're going to do. Um, it's about what team can go out and execute and cut down on the costly mistakes for 48 minutes. Is B.I. Uh, good to play just normal minutes tonight? Yes. 
Um, it should be a pretty good atmosphere in here tonight. You know, thinking back your your one season in New Orleans, or is there anything that comes to mind in terms of just you know it felt really electric in the building or anything like that? Yeah, exactly what you said. Fans are super pumped up, uh, excited to get in the building and, and root for a team that plays hard and play together. And it's just a, a fun time of year, and we're glad to be a, a part of it. We, I think, we've talked about what you want to do to keep players. Uh, you know, under their routine and, and kind of not letting it become bigger than what it is. What have you done to kind of just kind of make sure you're going about your, your regular routine to stay even keel? Same thing. Just stay stay in my routine and, you know, do what I would normally do on a, on a typical game day. Did you, uh, did you get one of the suits from Garrett Temple? I didn't. And I'm, I'm disappointed about not getting that suit. I saw some of them. They, they look pretty cool. Hey, Willie, the last time they had a Postseason game here. I guess you were on Golden State's bench then. You remember much about that game? I do. What do you, what do you remember about the atmosphere in the game itself? Uh, I remember us winning game. Uh, I mean, we, it was game four, I think. Uh, we won here, uh, lost game three. Um, but once again, just the fans here, the culture here, the, the community, the city, they rally around the team. And uh, when we came in that building for game three, it was loud. It, they were going crazy. And um, we expect much of that tonight. And I'm glad to be here in New Orleans or, and, and have an opportunity to go out and compete at the highest level in, in a yeah, it's game. So it's, it's pretty cool for them. So Willie Green talking about how much the atmosphere is going to mean something, and it's officially, it's sold out in this building. But this guy doesn't have to worry about getting a ticket. All-world <laughs> defensive end Cam Jordan, regular season, postseason, you know what it's like. Yeah, I mean, you know, regular season is, is what you fight for to get here, right? Now we're playing, playing seems way more dire than what we, you know, <laughs> playoff, you get a week to, to, to temper down, know who you're playing. This was regular season ends in less than, what, four or five days, you're back in here playing for everything. Um, and I mean, at least you don't have to go through a series, right? Now it's this game and this is the game that matters. When you play in a regular season, you guys play 16 games, 17 games now, I believe, in a regular season. Talk about the difference of the postseason atmosphere. You know, like when you are at home and you have home field advantage, what does that crowd do to you at home? Like the importance of the fans in the postseason? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of that, you know, don't turn me down, just keep turning me up. And it's just it's just the next level to, to the next situation. When you got the crowd behind you, when you got your energy flowing, there is no down for you. There is no, like, webs and flows of the game. It's only up. And so, you know, what you've experienced the last two weeks here in this in this stadium is what we feel every, every game in the Dome. I mean, the crowd is clearly here. It's sold out tonight, but it felt like it's been sold out the last month and a half or so. I mean, that is the energy that you need to help get you over that top sometimes. You know, there was another Cal Bear. There was an exceptional tight end in the NFL, Tony Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And I had him playing basketball. I had a couple of his games at Cal where he was really off the ground. Right. Did you ever think about playing hoops there? No, nah, I don't think I was good enough. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's a way to keep it 100. I like that. I like that. If you ask me now, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Coming out of high school, not so much. Yeah. Can we talk about the red out? I know you don't really. We yeah, yeah. we we were kind of talking about this, and you know. I, 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 I was, didn't bring that up. Yeah, no, I know, but we was kind of clowning about it a little bit earlier. He was sitting doing an interview with Sharif, and I was like, you know, man, everybody in here got on red. Right. Cam came in with some black. What we got to do to get you in? He said, I don't do red. I, I do shades got, of red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. I do as shades. Long, as long as long as he's going jump, man. We got you know uh, accents of red. Um, but all of your all of your rivals all the way from high school. High school is damper. They're like a, a red maroonish. Right. Uh, they're this. They're this like loser school over Chandler versus Chandler <laughs> High, which is a very you know ro royal blue mm -hmm. um, championship caliber football team. And then of course you got um, you got California or UC Berkeley, and we go against Stanford. We infer they have a dancing tree as their mascot, clown stuff, um, <laughs> and they're red. And then of course. You know, black and gold, we have the, the, the fail cons. So it's just a lot of red as adversaries. So as much as I'd love to support the Pellies, which I will, I might go home and grab some, like, navy blue because I like this. Okay. With I, the appreciate I appreciate that. I appreciate that, my man.
Strawberry Canyon. Man, <laughs> you, know, you know, nothing but people sitting up watching great games. It's a tight Wad Hill. Exactly. And Strawberry, it's a beautiful situation. <laughs> hey, thank you for stopping by. For sure. And by the way, thank you for your support all yeah. the years oh, you've been oh, coming man. to these games for the Pellets. Hey, jazz, jazz to the Pellets. I'm like the only one that's been here long so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cam Jordan, we're lucky to have him in this market. I'll tell you that right now. Now, we're going to continue to pick up on some of the comments. And by the way, what Willie Green was talking about, the atmosphere, the building, there's another guy who's pumped up. Let's hear also from the Pell shooting guard, Devontae Graham. I was just telling them, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to go and take my pregame nap because I'm just going to be like, I'm just ready to play, you know, so. But you try to just, you know, keep everything excited and, and I mean, the same until game time. So a totally different atmosphere. And I like what Cam said about it. You know, the postseason is different. You're amped up. And you know about the postseason. You've gone through the postseason before. So as you go through each playoff round, it gets even more severe. It does. It does. And, you know, I, I never had the experience of playing in a playoff game. Obviously, that's only been around for a couple of years. But this is... This is something that a lot of guys in this locker room can relate to because this is a NCAA field. Right. You know what I mean? So basically, it's a win or go home situation. You have to win to advance. This is not NBA-like. So you have to win tonight against the San Antonio Spurs. Then you have to win on Friday versus the LA Clippers. Then, Lord willing, you play the Phoenix Suns on Sunday. Now that's more of an NBA field because now it's four out of seven. But these next two, a lot of guys in both locker rooms should be able to relate to this because this has more of a NBA, I mean, a NCAA win or go home NCAA tournament right. field. And you pack accordingly. You pack if you're going, oh, to, man. You're going yes. to play the Clippers. Yes. You're feeling like, and we're going to book flights tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Win tonight, you book flights tomorrow because we could be on the air Sunday night. Okay? You can do the local telecast can be on the air with the exception of ABC. They're going to be the exclusive right. on Sundays. So we are we want the Pels to win. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. But we also want to call playoff games. Who are you telling? Thank you. Who are you telling? <laughs> so, now, earlier tonight, and it's been a real good season, to say the least, for the Pels because of the plan. The plan is in place for down the road. You mm -hmm. and I know it. And, and let's get into the conversation with the general manager of the Pels, because Aaron Summers caught up with Trajan Langdon just a few minutes ago. Let's pick up on that conversation now. Thanks, Joel and AD. I'm here with Trajan Langdon, Pelicans general manager. What a season it has been, the growth of this team from where they started this year and where they've ended. What have you seen under head coach Willie Green? Just consistency. Um, you know, think, you think about it a lot now, kind of where we are and where we came from, like you said, and I don't know what the start was, 3-16 and 16 or something like that. And I remember him just being in the back after some, whether we're getting blown out or losing tough games. And he just said, I'm going to stay consistent. My message is going to be consistent with this group. Stay together, keep fighting, keep competing. Um, I think one thing that, that, that Griff and I have taken away is they've, he and the coaching staff have never come to us like, we don't have enough or we need this or we need that. He said, we have enough here. We just need to keep growing, stay consistent, um, keep teaching. Uh, and we have a very coachable group and they've been a joy to be around. and. Um, to have this opportunity with this group is just, uh, it's exciting. Someone that you brought in here to be a part of this group, CJ McCollum, how valuable was that acquisition? Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't think players like that become available in this league very often. He's uh, a guy that's been a fringe all-star for so long, has played in huge games in Portland and has been a big part of that run. Uh, the many, the playoff run that they've had and going to the Western Conference Finals, played in big closeout games. So for us was bringing in a veteran this has had that experience and has been in a winning culture to uh, to kind of show that um, with this group. And he's done that. He's a guy that's going to get on the court, know exactly what he wants to do and play with a lot of confidence. And I think it rubs off on our players. You talk about his experience, but on the other side, you have a really young team here. How big is this playing game for them to gain that type of experience? Yeah, great question. Um, it's something that we've wanted for this young group for a couple years now. And obviously, uh, I thought we were playing really well our first year here a couple years ago, and then the season got cut short and didn't play like we wanted to down the bubble in Orlando when we had a chance to get in the play-in. And then last year, ended the season with several of our key players hurt, so that chance kind of eluded us as well. And so here, to start the way we did, like we've talked about, and to be here and giving our young players this experience is just phenomenal. And it's something that um, 
you know, that we look forward to. And obviously we didn't think we had a chance at early on and to get here has just been an incredible, um, it's just been incredible. How can what has been accomplished already this season, getting this opportunity here tonight, be a foundation of what's to come for this team, this organization? Yeah, I think you look at some teams that have had this kind of run um, and what they've done to kind of build on it. The, the Phoenix Suns a couple years ago in the bubble and how they built on it last year. Uh, Memphis Grizzlies last year in the play on and how they built on it this year. So I think those are some kind of some examples you look at. Um, and I think our players are going to look at the slow start and kind of how we built and how we've, you know, crescendoed now. And, uh, you know, we'll make a run now and we'll, we'll I think our guys will see the confidence. The canvas little will grow. Um, a lot of work in the summer will lead into a lot of confidence going into next year and seeing what we can do. All right, other than tonight, what's been your favorite part of this season, this experience this year? That's a great, I, for me, I think we just have a, a great group. And, and I think seeing Willie and staff grow as the year has gone along and seeing our team grow and, and they've never gotten down on themselves, regardless if it's a huge loss or a huge win, they've stayed consistent, they stayed growing and they just have a lot of confidence in themselves. They really enjoy coming to work every day, getting better. And I just think seeing that growth and seeing them being around each other in practice, in games, post game, at dinners, um, has been a lot of fun to watch. It's been a lot of fun to experience, to be a part of. Thank you for joining us. Guys, back to you. Thank you, Aaron. And we want to remind everybody, you can get your season tickets for next year. They're on sale right now. And access to potential playoff tickets for this year. So early bird pricing continues. Tickets are going to be on sale. It ends tonight on the early bird pricing, though. Don't forget. So go to pelicans.com to lock in your lowest prices right now. And you can learn about the benefits, including, including the access to the playoff tickets potentially for this year but there are benefits so go to pelicans.com right now early bird pricing continues through this evening so it is the 13th last day for early bird pricing that's pelicans.com i'd give out the phone number but i think everybody that was ready to answer a phone <laughs> is going to be in the building tonight wearing red joel myers antonio daniels we continue as we get ready for the nine against the 10 seed. Let's talk about a, a couple of things. And, and one thing that Trajan Langdon just played off of, and I give Willie Green and the staff a lot of credit, and mm. it starts with Griff, Trajan, Swin, Bryson Graham, that they never lost their focus on where they wanted to be. Not about right away, but down the road and into subsequent seasons. Nobody let go of the rope. When they lost 16 of the first 19 games, you're almost 25% of the way through the schedule, AD, so you could have really let down. Brick by brick. You know, uh, I, I remember hearing that all the time when I was a child, and what brick by brick means, you continue to build. It doesn't, it, you don't put all the bricks in at the same time. You right. put them in one at a time. When this team was 1-12, and 12, and then they were 3-16, and 16, as you just referenced, I could not be more impressed with going into shoot-around and seeing how engaged and how optimistic Willie Green was with his team. I've been on bad teams before. I've been on bad teams. I've been in bad shoot-arounds. I know what that's like. When right. a team is struggling, the spirit that was within those shoot-arounds of guys high-fiving each other, them chanting, them doing competitive games, Willie Green never blinked. He never blinked. He never allowed pessimism. He never allowed the outside noise of, you know what, the season's over, maybe this team should tank, all these other things. He never allowed that to impact his thought on what he knew that this team could be. And you remember all the way back in November, Joe, him saying at that time, we are losing games now that we are going to win come February, March, and right. April, and he was spot on. You know, it's, I'm glad you brought the, the attitude and Willie Green in particular up because they never lost that. And we were at shoot-around, we were at practice, we saw the spirit, the energy, and even when they were 3-16, and 16, it was there. But let me ask you this because Willie Green played at a high level. He was in this league a long time, mm -hmm. and he succeeded in this league. And, and he wasn't the big scorer, but he was a great two-way player. Right. Do you think that potentially, and, and also the positive guys that he assisted, Steve Kerr first, won a couple of rings mm -hmm. there, three years with Steve, and then Monty the last two years, who went to the finals last year with Monty Williams. So as a player, AD, we saw Willie Green, he was a grinder. He worked hard. 
and then he's around two really productive, positive guys. So here's the thing, Joe. I I've said this from day one. I think the most important thing in today's NBA is a coach's ability to relate to his players. So you just went through Willie Green's resume as a player, right? He has started. He's come off the bench. He's been called on the score. He has been a sixth man. He has been in position where his minutes weren't guaranteed, and he's also been in a position where he didn't play at all. So now you can relate to everybody up and down that bench, from a Brandon Ingram to a C.J. McCollum, all the way down to Jose Alvarado. His ability to communicate, he has said, he has taken that from Monty Williams. He has taken that from Steve Kerr, and it's paid dividends throughout the course of this season. Yeah, and I, I really loved when C.J. McCollum got here, and this is out of the Greg Popovich playbook. When C.J. McCollum got here, right away, Willie Green put together a dinner with C.J. and Brandon Ingram. And they sat down for a few hours at a restaurant, and they had a heart-to-heart. -heart. That means a lot to players. When your coach is that trusting, that believable, and he's going to be forthright and honest with you and upfront because you saw it, I saw it, with Greg Popovich firsthand. Right, and you just talked about the dinner. So with B.I. and also with C.J. McCullum. So that is 66% of the big three. Right. So now you bring in Jonas Valanciunas. Now you are talking about something special. When you talk about the Pelicans' big three with those guys, C.J. McCollum is just different. He's different. And He's I remember keeper. right prior, <laughs> prior to C.J. McCollum coming here, one of the things that Griff talked to us about on the broadcast was his ability to play the point guard position. Because he's been known as a scorer. That's it. Certified bucket getter is what I've called it. Right. But now he's come here as a lead guard, and not only has he scored the basketball, but his ability to facilitate, to get everybody involved, and his skill set complements what B.I. and what Jonas both need as well. Well, and then you put him in the backcourt because Herb basically is starting as your two. So that with C.J. at the one, you put him in the backcourt, this is such a healthy situation for Herb Jones to be around a guy, an all-star, a guy who's been there, done that. And now, remember, and also this says a lot about C.J. McCollum, Damian Lillard was the guy in Portland. So you've got a Batman and Robin. Are you willing to be Robin? Yeah, he was. He didn't care. As long as the team won, he was all in. So he comes to here, he comes to the Pels now, and all of a sudden, guys look at him differently because he's not Robin. In fact, he's a leader in this locker room, a mature 30-year-old, the president of the Players Association. So this is a different role for him. But as I talked to him, he told you too, he really wanted to be here. He wanted this role. So we constantly talk about changing the narrative here in New Orleans. And it starts with the fans changing, showing up and showing out. And then you have players that also come in and they change the narrative by basically saying, this is exactly where I want to be. And that's exactly what CJ said the moment that he stepped foot in New Orleans. Yeah, I just had that discussion with him recently when we were in Memphis. At lunch in Memphis, told me how happy he was to be here. Now, you just brought up the big three. And before we hear from Larry Nance, and we will on the big three, and especially Brandon Ingram, look at it this way for down the road. So the big three this year is Jonas Valanciunas in the middle, third best in double-doubles in the league this year, and then two guys that can give you 25-30 a night, and that's Brandon Ingram and C.J. McCollum. Add to that next season, mm. okay? As healthy as it is right now, add to that next year a guy who averaged 25 last year in Zion Williamson and more than 25 a game. Not too bad to start with. I, this is my thing. I am not big on names. I'm big on fit. You know what I mean? Right. Like that, that's my big thing. I'm big on skill sets complementing one another. So when you look at what CJ brings to the table, Jonas's ability, there's a reason that Griff and those guys traded for Jonas Valanciunas. There's a reason that you drafted Trey Murphy. We haven't had an opportunity to see that yet because you do that because of Zion Williamson along with Brandon Ingram. This is before CJ McCollum right. was even acquired. Now you put C.J. McCollum in that mix. Now you're getting a different Jonas Valanciunas. You're getting a Trey Murphy that is getting spot-up jump shots out of double teams. People call us homers if we say this team is going to be dangerous. And I say this unapologetically. I will die on this hill. This team, next year, whole and healthy with the big three that we just discussed with Jonas Valanciunas, with Brandon Ingram, with C.J. McCollum, and... Zion Williamson, this team is going to be a real problem for the league.
I always say an issue. They are going to be an issue, and I like problem too. Now, Brandon Ingram sound, he's back, and he's back after the problems, as you all know, with the hamstring. Larry Nance, Larry Nance Jr., his dad was a serious player as well. We've talked about that before. Larry Nance discussed Brandon Ingram. See, early in my career, I, I got a chance. I was fortunate enough to play with BI in LA. Uh, and you know, obviously a heck of a player there, but you know, I, being in the Eastern Conference for the past three years and not really getting to see him that much, um, and now being on the same team, like I did not really realize how really, how good of a playmaker he actually is. Um, he sees the court really well, looks for his teammates, um, incredibly unselfish, which is uh, rare for a player of his caliber. Um, but honestly, like like you said, he just affects the game in a lot of different ways, especially especially now, you know, defensively with his length. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled at, at the player he's turned out to be, and obviously he's about 25, so he's still going and growing. So uh, I'm excited to see the finished product. This is only halfway. So the right time of the year for Brandon Ingram to be sound, sound back, and hopefully a win tonight. But you've got a big three on the other side as well, and a guy that we both like a lot. And now he's back and he's healthy because he had a bug and he lost seven, eight pounds. Mm -hmm. And he played in the last game. He played 32 minutes in their loss at Dallas in their last game of the season on Sunday. And that is the guy who leads the NBA in assists to turnover ratio. Plays beyond his years, a 25-year-old. You like him as much as I do, and that's DeJounte Murray. Classic pop guard. Classic pop guard. He's long, he's linky, he's athletic, and he has a defensive mindset. What they did with DeJounte Murray is the same thing that they did with Kawhi Leonard. What they did is they, gra they drafted a guy who is defensive-minded and put him with a really, really good shot doctor like Chip England and right. developed him offensively. They go as he goes. Like, now the Spurs are in rebuild mode, and they are rebuilding around this young man in DeJounte Murray. You just talked about his assist-to-turnover ratio. He makes excellent decisions with that basketball, but he doesn't just score. He is an excellent two-way guard as well. He has continued to grow every year in this league. Initially, he was a guy that liked to play in the paint like Tony Parker, but now he is slowly but surely knocked down that 15-footer with efficiency and becoming a a decent, I'll say decent, because there's still room for growth right. behind that three-point line. Yeah, he's a really good mid-range shooter. Yes, though. he is. He's a wingspan guard, a long, and by the way, leads the league in steals too. So he gets it done at the defensive end of the floor. Then they have Jakob Pertl. Before we get to Kelton Johnson, Jakob Pertl knows his role very yes. well, doesn't he? Yes. And he's another 25-year-old. He knows his role. He's a double-double machine, which he's averaged a double-double against the Pels in the four games this year. And he's just a high-screen guy and a putback guy. And he's got a nice little flip, like a little jump hook now around the rim. He's not a star, but he's a star in his role. You got so it. when you talk about Jakob Pertl, and you just referenced it, he understands what he does. If he catches the ball at 10 feet, he's not even looking at the rim. So he understands that he's a pick and roll guy. He's not a pick and pop guy. The San Antonio Spurs do a lot of pick and roll and a lot of dribble handoffs. So one of the things he has become really good at is rolling, catching that ball in the paint and finishing. Also offensive rebounding, offensive rebounding as well. Right. So again, when you talk about, he's not a DeJounte Murray type star. His numbers aren't going to blow you off the screen, but he's very impactful and effective in the role that he's asked to play. And then there's a young man who got pushed into a role he didn't anticipate over the summer. And that's because of COVID and some injuries and illnesses. And what a bonus for him. He won gold over the summer playing for the U.S. Olympic team. And it's amazing what Keldon Johnson has looked like confidence-wise ever since he was around the best in the world. Can you imagine? Being around the best in the world for that amount of time, what right. it does for your confidence as a young player. Right. You can feel good about yourself. Right. You can feel good. You can be confident. He's coming off a really good year last year. But now you give me a summer with some of the NBA's best and an opportunity to compete against the world's best on that stage. He has come back a different player as far as confidence is concerned. And he's that second guy. They, DeJounte Murray is the Batman, and Keldon Johnson has become the Robin. And he's a really good Robin. Yeah, and then they've got a draft pick, De Devin Vassell, from last year, who is the range guy for them. Uh, but also another guy, and he's really hurt the Pels this year. And he's a good defender. He came over at the trade deadline yeah, from Boston for Derek White, if you remember. And he's hit threes. He's hit 50% of his threes against the Pels this year. The rest of the league, probably 25%. <laughs> but the Josh, rest of the league don't matter right, right now. Josh Richardson, yeah, he's the, a good player. Right, he is a good player. And he's been a, he's been a difference maker for the Spurs because, again, the same way DeJounte Murray was a 
is a pop guard, show us Josh Richardson. We talk about the Pels' second line and the fact that there's some dogs in that second line. Right. Jose Alvarado, Najee Marshall, Larry Nance, Josh Richardson is somebody you can throw in that category of being a dog. He is willing to do the dirty work and do the things that it takes to win basketball games. Yeah, former second-round pick out of Tennessee, made his mark with Miami before he moved to Dallas and then up to Boston. Uh, we always say we're surrounded by royalty around For here. For sure. Teresa Weatherspoon's a Hall of Famer. She's on the coaching staff, and we're really fortunate to have Teresa Weatherspoon. Well, now we have another Hall of Famer. So we have two Hall of Famers right here, a part of the Pels front office and coaching staff, and that is Swin Cash. Let's pick up on that conversation Swin just had with Aaron Summers. Thanks, Joel and AD. I'm here with Swin Cash, VP of Basketball Operations, Team Development, and recent Hall of Famer. Thank How does that you. feel? Thank you, Aaron. Um, it feels good. I'm excited. Um, my family's been excited, been waiting for this. Um, so I think we're going to have a great time in September. I had an amazing weekend, and I was glad that it happened here in New Orleans. Has a nice ring to it. When people talk about the Pelicans and bring up that name, what do you hope comes to mind for fans, anybody that maybe isn't from around here? I hope that, uh, you know, when they think about just kind of me and, and coming here and what we've been able to do and hope continue to do in the future is that, you know, we just bought in, bought into the city. We love the city. Um, we've tried to just instill kind of the values on the, on the court, off the court, in the community um, of what New Orleans is truly about. And so I hope that we embody that. And I hope when it's all said and done that people look at um, this era and this time as something that really kind of brought basketball, not only to New Orleans, but throughout Louisiana. As the head of team development, what can you actually do to instill a culture like that? You know, um, culture is a day to day thing. It is every second just driving home the details. It is making sure you're cultivating an atmosphere where players want to be here. Great staff want to be here. Uh, you all want to cover our games. And so that takes just making sure your hands are there. I give a lot of credit also to my team and, and to Griff, um, allowing me the space to be able to build out kind of what we needed in order to make sure that our culture is going to be something here that has sustainability. How much of that development happens on the court versus off of the court? Yeah, so I think it's it's a lot of it is relationship based too. I, I think uh, you know, I, I tell Marche, I tell Ethan, um, all of our all our staff all the time, is what we do is so relationship based. It's about the human element. It's not just about the points they score out here or on the court. It's about understanding who they are as people, our players, our staff. Um, so we're very detail oriented um, and we try to make sure that our staff understands New Orleans. So off the court, that's the piece that we're still building, still working towards. And I love all of our fans reaching out to us on social media, engaging with us. Uh, the Pels 12 has been amazing, just kind of seeing how they continue to grow. Um, that's what we want to see. And that's what we're trying to continue to push here in New Orleans. For a team that's as young as this team is, how important is that development off the court and in trying to help them get acclimated to the NBA, what it's like to play at this level? Yeah, so it's, it's really funny because I, I wear kind of multiple hats and uh, there's times when I could be talking to guys about, you know, schemes, basketball stuff that may have happened on the court and then the next minute I'm talking to them about, all right, Where's, where's our next LLC? What are we looking to develop? What are you what are you talking about right now? Are you into crypto? You're into this? And so having kind of like those worldly views are really, really important, especially for young men who um, are thrust into not only the spotlight, but have this amount of money where they're able to change not only their life, but generational wealth. And so I remember as a player not having certain resources that I am just every day making sure that we're providing and trying to have here for our players and for our staff. We see you on social media interacting with the team and seeing it at practice or at games. Looks like you guys have a lot of fun. You have a fun relationship. How enjoyable is this team to be around? Well, uh, you know what? I will say this. This team has so many inside jokes that it's pretty ridiculous. Um, I love them. Um, I love who they are as people, the ups and downs. Even when they're mad, still walk up and give a hug and they're like, oh, okay, auntie. Um, it's funny because I used to always be the young one. And now when I got that kind of auntie uh, title, I'm looking at them like, I'm Vino, I'm fine. Why can we get something else? But they go back to it. So um, it was funny because I'll tell you a story. When Trey first got here and I was telling him, I said, it's not auntie in New Orleans, it's TD. And they were like, he was like, oh no, no way. I'm not saying it. So my goal is at some point to get one of them to, instead of saying auntie, to say TD, to see how true to New Orleans they really are. But you know, it's fun. It's a fun group, Aaron. You've been around, you see how we are. Um, we love to just kind of chop it up with each other. And that's the kind of atmosphere you want to be in. Can you shoot Trey? 
Speaking of Trey Murphy. Who was it? <laughs> Speaking of Trey, he's always telling us he can shoot, but he's going to blame the coach. I, I, I think he missed that shot. Tonight, the culmination of such a long season, but being able to have a play-in game with this young group, how much fun is it going to be? How excited are you? Listen, um, it's going to be a red sea in here. You and I are both representing right now. Uh, this is what New Orleans has been waiting for, just taking steps and having progress. And I give a lot of credit to Coach Green, his staff, what they've been able to do. I love our front office, where we continue to just keep building. And, um, you know, this is what we deserve. And we're going to take it step by step. I trust in our players. I know they're ready to go. And you just jump the ball up and let's see what happens. All right, we're looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Go Pels. Guys. Thanks to Swin Cash joining Aaron Summers and we're the fortunate ones as we welcome you back as we continue on Pelicans Live. This is the pregame of the postseason for the Pels, the 9 against the 10. It's all brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, Joel Myers, Antonio Daniels. And I like what Swin was talking about at the tail end about chemistry. And we'll get into the rookie class in just a minute, but you and I have been in a lot of practices this year. And you've said, and I like what you've said, this is not automatic. It's not, it's normal. not normal. These guys care about each other. And they want each other to succeed, even though it may cost them minutes or a possible spot in the rotation. But that's how the chemistry is developing. You, you know what, though, man? Like, chemistry can be, you can fake it. You know, like, when you right. see Jose Alvarado and, and these guys, even before they sign their contracts on the side, cheering each other, there's a thing that's called fake cheer. <laughs> you can actually be on the side cheering for someone that, and you can feel it as right. a teammate. This is sustainable because it's authentic. This is authentic. These guys really want to see each other succeed. This isn't normal, not that part. I'm talking about the fact of a team being one and 12, of a team being three and 16, and for them to be this full of energy, right. this full of life. Like, there's a lot of things in a NBA locker room that are important. You know what I mean? You can talk about defensive schemes. You can talk about relationships. You can talk about offensive schemes. You can talk about guys understanding their roles, camaraderie, how you get together on the bus, on the plane. There's nothing more important than chemistry, though. There's nothing more important than chemistry. And by, by chemistry, I'm referring to guys having a genuine love for one another right. to succeed. Because if that chemistry is not there, Joel, your goal is different than mine. My goal is different than the guy that's next to me. When everybody is in tune to the same goal, that's how chemistry is developed. Yeah, they care, and it's genuine. And you said players can tell if it's genuine or it's fake, and it's they care about each other. I don't know if you picked up on the social media that the Pels put out yesterday, but and at the end of practice yesterday, first, Najee singing happy birthday <laughs> to Jose, and we're going to work on Najee's singing. We're going to work on his pipes a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> at least carry a tune. So we're going to work on that with Nodge. But after that, Bove is the strength and conditioning coach and a very good one, one of the best in the NBA. And what he's been doing is, is a competition on pairs and teams, conditioning and reps. And so it boiled down to a couple of teams. And Billy Hernan Gomez, along with Tony Snell, and Tony's a great addition because he's a guy that cares. He's a pro. So he's not getting minutes now, but he cares about his teammates. So you could tell. Billy and Tony won the belt. And it was classic when they raised it above. It was like they were in the WWE coming off the top turnbuckle. But if you pick up on Pel social media and some of the videos that are out there on pelicans.com, you'll see it's firsthand how much they care. So, so I, I go all the way back to a game earlier this year, right? The, we were here, the Pels won. They're walking up the floor, the place is going crazy, and Najee Marshall is dancing with Brandon Ingram. <laughs> and the reason it's important is because Najee didn't play one minute. Right. Najee didn't play one minute. I, I, last night, watching the Minnesota game, when that game was over, Josh Okogie is dancing with Anthony Edwards. Josh Okogie played eight seconds. That's authenticity. Right. That's really caring about the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not how I played my minutes. It's the fact that we won as a unit. And when everybody feels involved, and this is what, where I credit head coach Willie Green, Fred Vincent, Casey Hill, um, JC, where I give all these guys credit, T-Spoon, is they make sure 
even if you are playing 30 minutes, 35 minutes, or not playing at all, you still feel involved as far as what's going on here. Again, chemistry, it's developed. It's developed over time. Willie Green has done a great job speaking grace and life and confidence into this young unit, unit so that way when their number's called, they're ready to go. Yeah, and it's going to be sustainable. That's what Griff talks about all the time because there's going to be continuity and consistency now on the roster because there is a plan in place. And I bring that up because we could talk about the rookie class forever. And it starts, Trey 17th overall, Herb's 35th overall, and then who knew we'd fall in love with Jose Alvarado as much as we have, who is not drafted and the defensive player in the ACC out of Georgia Tech. So we'll start with 17 before we get to a lock for first team all rookie and should be first team all defense. We'll start with Trey because Trey has been up and down between the squadron and he was the first pick for the Pell, 17th overall. He was determined to get it right. Anytime I talk to him, yes sir, no sir. He was all business and he was respectful. And I really like his future because I've said to you on the air, Cam Johnson's in his third year now and he is really good for the Phoenix Suns. Trey Murphy is Cam Johnson and maybe even more athletic. I, I think Trey Murphy's ceiling. I was just talking to Mark Jones of ESPN about this. I don't think people grasp the concept of Trey Murphy's ceiling because what they see him as is just this. He's a spot up shooter. Oh yeah, you know, he can knock down open shots. He is much more than this. And the more reps that he gets and the more comfortable he gets with his ability to one, put that ball on the floor, and two, when he learns how to use his athleticism like this, he is going to be a serious problem. Yeah, I know he can shoot the heck out the ball, but there's so much more to his game than we haven't have had an opportunity to see. And he's also, you know, you can be a great guy, but if you can't play, it doesn't matter. Right. But <laughs> right. he's also an exceptional person. He's a quality young but man. But the thing is, Joe, who and in this locker room is that's, it? That's I was about to say. Who is it? What they're doing is they're bringing in, we don't have any knuckleheads in this locker that's room. That's right. That's what it boils down to. Guys that care about each other, they're all in on the success of each other. So we started with Trey because Trey is just scratching the surface. I like what you said about upside. He is going to be a real issue for down the road purposes. And especially when he's on the same side of the floor as Zion and they're trying to drop a double into the lap of Zion. Okay, we could spend about eight hours on 35th overall mm. and out of Alabama and another guy who cares about his teammates. And he's, he's not a loud voice. What he is, he's loud on the floor because of his natural instincts, his poise, his composure. You love what I see from and the same way I feel about Herb Jones. Well, when I think about Herb Jones, I also think about what the NBA is like for most rookies, right? You come from college, and a lot of times you're drafted in college because you can score the basketball. They really struggle on the defensive side of the ball. Right. And that's why a lot of rookies are in and out the rotation, up and down from the G League, because they struggle grasping defensive concepts, rotation, understanding, their personnel, all of these different things. And we can talk about Herb Jones being so far ahead of the curve defensively, so far ahead of the curve in the fact that he should be on someone's all defensive team. Right. I don't care if it's a team. I'm not talking about rookie. Well, I'm talking lock. about as know, a whole. I, I think he's a lock for one right. of the two teams. I'm talking about as a whole. But what I don't think many people know about Herb Jones or understand about Herb Jones is his work ethic. His work ethic, where he started when this year began as far as his ability to shoot that basketball and where he is now, being a threat offensively. Yeah, and he's in the gym early. He stays afterwards. He shoots. He and Najee have a thing going. Now, Brandon Ingram's involved as well, competition. Right. So it's, it's real healthy, the environment and what Herb is doing. Don't forget, Herb is third in the league in steals. He's not third among rookies. He leads all rookies. Third in the league in steals third in the league in deflections. And when you put together blocks and steals, he set a new team record for rookies. I'll say this, though, Joe. In today's NBA, you need these guys. Right. These guys are valuable. They're glue. Right, because the thing is, every night you're going to play against someone on the other team that is an offensive issue in the backcourt. You know what I mean? Whether it's LeBron James, Luka, Donovan Mitchell, right. um, go down the list. Steph Curry, tonight, DeJounte Murray. You can go down the list of different guys in the today's NBA that you can put Herb Jones on, Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, 
and allow him to use his defensive prowess. So that way you can somewhat ask B.I. not to guard the best player on the other team so he can use his offensive skill for what it's needed for. You need guys like Herb Jones in your starting lineup. Right. Well, I like the point you made because you're not going to take a lot out of the gas tank of your best offensive players when you've got a Herb Jones who is going to be that lockdown guy. And who embraces that role. Loves that role. So Antonio Daniels, if you don't know, he's already got three children. If he didn't, I would think that Jose Alvarado <laughs> is his adopted son. <laughs> there is a connection that is so good between these two people. And I love what I see. And I, I've said on the air, I don't like Jose Alvarado. I love him. He is such a genuinely great young man. And where he came from, how hard he has worked to get to this point, and it's just the beginning. Let's face it. We're the fortunate ones to be around somebody that, that has a heart as good as Jose's heart. So I bring it up. You've adopted him. You've been in his ear, but I like the guidance you've also given him. You know, th there are certain guys, for whatever reason, that you have a connection with. And this started all the way back in training camp and into the beginning of the season, where Jose sought me for advice about his game, what he was doing, what he needed to do, how he could stay in this league for a lengthy amount of time. And this started early on in plane rides or after training camp sitting with me in the bleachers. There's a humbleness to him. There's a humbleness to Jose Alvarado, and there are certain guys that you just want to see right. beat, beat the odds. You know, I heard that Jose Alvarado had great workouts in the summer with, before the draft, but everybody kept saying he's too small. So the odds were stacked against him. And you know what he did, man? He debunked them all. He debunked them all. And he told me at that time, AD, if I get my opportunity, I am not looking back. And he has not looked back. I told him at that time, continue to do what you're doing. When your opportunity comes, don't just take advantage of it. Kick the door in. Right. Kick the door in. So now before every game, we have an opportunity to talk, chop it up a little bit, laugh a little bit, and then talk about him coming in and changing the game. Look, Joe, I'm not telling you something you don't know. His energy, his effort, and his heart is infectious and it's contagious. Not just with us, not just with his teammates, but also with the fans. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. Because as we talk about Jose Alvarado, the chemistry is also developed where this city is now linked into this group. And I've been here for 10 years. And this city is embracing this group. There's a connection. AD, I'm telling you, I haven't seen this before in my 10 years, but it's only going to get better for all of us because the city also sees how much these guys care about being here. And I don't know if we had that before, where we had a group, 10, 12 guys, that really said, I want to be here. I want to help this program grow. And Jose, talk about a heart. That, that, that's how it starts though. When you have CJ McCollum coming in and he's saying, New Orleans is where I want it to be. Right. Jose Alvarado coming out saying, man, New Orleans is home. When you have guys that, now right now, this team is a reflection of this city. Anytime I'm around and I'm talking to fans, they want to see out of this team a reflection of this city. This city is resilient. They're blue collar, they're hard working, and they wear their heart on their sleeve. That's what they want to see out of this Pelicans team. And that's exactly what this Pelican team exemplifies. Yeah, and I mentioned to AD when he got here three years ago, I said to AD, if you embrace the city, they'll give it back to you probably a million times more because the genuine love they will have. You, if you take in everything that's good and there's a lot of things that are good no about question. the city, you'll get it right back no question. and it multiply it. So. That's developing. The rookie class is just a, it's not a home run, it's a grand slam. That's how good this group has been. And they've also energized all the other, other guys in the locker room. So there's one guy we haven't talked about, though, and I don't know if I've been around a guy. Uh, Jonas is a really good teammate, too, but Billy Hernan, <laughs> yeah, I knew you were going. Billy Hernan yeah. Gomez never had a bad day. He picks up every one of his teammates all the time, doesn't he? Well, the thing is, it's different to say he's never had a bad day because you know he's had a bad day. We just had, we just, uh, well, he, he doesn't show that to us. He won't let us And know. that's the difference in people. Right. Somebody can have a bad day, and they will let you know immediately that they have a bad day. I say, in my 13-year career, and now covering the NBA since I retired, I have never seen a more positive teammate than Billy Hernan Gomez. That says a lot because right. I played with some really positive guys. But I've never seen a guy as upbeat as Billy, regardless of the circumstances, though. It's easy to be upbeat when you're playing 30 minutes a night. It's easy to be upbeat when everything is going fantastic.
But what about when you don't play eight straight games? Yeah, and that's, what about, and that's recent. Right. What about when you're averaging a double-double for five games and you're out of rotation for the next ten? His, his demeanor and his energy never changes. The same thing that we say about Jose Alvarado, right. with it being infectious and contagious, we can say that same thing about Billy Hernan Gomez. Always smiling, always happy, always there to pick you up. I'm glad you brought him up. Yeah, this locker room has got a lot of really good people, uh, big-hearted guys that care about each other, and that's where it begins. you got to be able to play, but it, it helps when you're linked together and there's a chemistry, and I think the city is recognizing that as well. And I bring that up because there's some sweet things going on with the fan base. Mm -hmm. And you got into it, and I've been, I got my t-shirt too, and there was a, a kind of a snide remark about, yeah, the Pels and their 12 fans. All 12 of you is All, what JJ right, said. All right, 12 of right. you. So, and. Flip the script yeah, is what they did. Yeah, what they did was they had fun with it. They took off and they ran with it. So we're going to talk about it when we come back, but representing the Pels 12. Let's pick up with the conversation Aaron Summers had with their rep and a very good one, Rel Myers. Joel and AD, I am here with Rel Myers, co-founder of Pels 12. Really exciting times and a lot of it due to you bringing the fan base along and, and creating a big name for the Pelicans fan base to follow. When did you start being a fan of the Pelicans? Uh, I've been a fan of the franchise since the team moved here about 20 years ago. Um, so I've just been, I kind of became a diehard fan probably in the last five or six years or so, um, but I've always been a fan of the team in general. How did the Pels 12 come to be? So um, a lot of people know about the J.J. Reddick tweet, and he was saying that the Pelicans had 12 fans. So we kind of took that, like, you know, we're not going to let you talk about us. We'll make fun of ourselves. So we just kind of took that on as, like, you know, there may be 12 of us, but we're the loudest, passionate, you know, most passionate fans ever. So um, and then we just started getting together to, to watch uh, the games with some other people from Twitter, and it's just snowballed since then. When did all this start? Sometime over this season? Yeah, this all just started uh, about a month ago. Whenever we played Memphis in early March, that's when everything kind of started. That was the first time, and then it's just been snowballing from there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not just 12 of you anymore. I know you're going to have a section here at the game tonight. I've been seeing the watch parties, how many people are coming out. How big of a group is this fan group now? Yeah, uh, we just had a pregame party at the Rusty Nail, and I'm sure there was uh, over 125 people there, inside and outside. Um, so it went from being 30 people at the first one to quickly going beyond 100. And we've only done this maybe like five or six times in the last month or so. So it's really catching on. It's really fun. Why do you think that the Pels 12 has caught on, you know, the momentum that the team has had this season? It's kind of all working together, I guess, to kind of create more of excitement around the community. I think it's really caught on because um, a lot of us kind of, we are the biggest Pelicans fan that we know, right? So when you meet someone else that's as big of a fan as you are, it's the coolest thing ever. So we've all been able to grow these bonds and special relationships with each other just over, just from the beginning of this season, really. But since we've been able to get out in person and see each other, it's been so much fun. How excited are you for tonight's game to be able to be in, in a postseason kind of atmosphere, full house? I was here for that 2018 playoff run when we swept the Blazers, and uh, I think it's going to rival that. It's going to be just as exciting, uh, maybe maybe better, maybe more exciting. I don't know. It's a big game. <laughs> it is a definitely a big game. A crispy, crunchy chicken wanted to give everybody Pels 12 some swag, a little bag here, a free dinner here yes, at the sir. arena and everything. So we have more bags for you, but definitely want you guys to go away with something. We appreciate awesome. what you've done to kind of build a little more of the Pelicans fan base around this team. It's been an exciting time and we really appreciate having you. Awesome. Yeah. We're just getting started, so stay tuned. <laughs> Three, Guys. Two. Thank you, Aaron, and thanks to Rel Myers and everybody that is associated with Pels 12. As I've said on the air with you a lot, tw Pels 12 and growing. Growing. And growing. <laughs> <laughs> Expanding rapidly. Now, don't forget, if the Pels win tonight, they play the Clippers in LA on Friday, if they win the two games, playoff tickets, okay? They're going on sale Saturday. So get a win tonight, get a win Friday, playoff tickets on sale Saturday, April 16th. Go to pelicans.com forward slash tickets, okay? Pelicans.com 
forward slash tickets, and that will start at 9 a.m. So get ready, 9 a.m. on Saturday. As we get ready to wrap things up, and you and I could talk about this team for a long time because we really like where it's going. And we were just talking about, uh, you got Luca in Dallas, you got John Memphis, you have DeJounte Murray who we're going to see tonight, you have the Pels, and now the Pels have become a really deep team. And, and Houston's only going to get better because of the picks and their young talent. So the Southwest Division is going to be difficult, but encouraging signs all across the board. But the healthy part of it for the Pels, they're already where you want to be. They're already advancing in the right direction because the division's getting really difficult. Right, you just take your time. I know everybody wants to expedite the process. Right. This is something that you can't expedite. You know, we would love to have Zion back to play alongside B.I., C.J. McCollum, Jonas Valanciunas, and this young core to see what it looks like. Okay, that's not happening right now. So you take what you can and you slowly but surely, brick by brick it. What I mean is you put a brick in the foundation every time. Every opportunity you get to advance, you take advantage of the experience. And, and oh, by the way, the Pels might have a top 10 pick. I don't want to jinx it, but it looks like that pick from Southern California may be making its way here as well with the eighth worst record in the NBA. Now, let's get, as we get ready to wrap things up, and I said we could talk about this team a long time, give me some keys going in. I got two of them for you. And obviously the first one is you have to control DeJounte Murray. You have to control DeJounte Murray. You look at the difference between the three wins and the one loss. In the three wins, he's averaging 18, 11 and a half, and 10. And then the one loss, he's giving you 17, nine, and five five assists. Right. You know what I mean? So you have to control DeJounte Murray. That's first and foremost because they go as he goes. He's their star. Second, you got to win at any cost. Listen, this is a NCAA tournament setup. It's win or go home. Right. I don't care what it takes to win. Just win. Do not get out hustled. We saw that here a couple weeks ago. The San Antonio Spurs came into the Smoothie King Center and out hustled the New Orleans Pelicans. You win or go home, Basically, what that means is you do whatever it takes to win tonight's game. You worry about Friday's game when you get to Friday. Tonight, do whatever it takes to win. Win at any cost. And AD won a ring. He's a champion. The playoffs are a different story yes. completely. It'll slow down a little bit. Most of the time it does. And you got to get stops. You do. Situational stops. Here's the thing. The game is going to slow down. So you have to get stops on one end, and you have to be able to execute in the half court on the other end. So what you'll see around this playoff time, scores will be down a little bit because it becomes more about executing in the half court as opposed to running up and down the floor. You have to be able to execute now with these fans going crazy. This is why the mental aspect of the postseason is so incredibly important. All right, we're in another racing room here. Thank you as usual. Enjoyed it. Can't is it over? I can't wait. I guess it's over. I can't <laughs> wait. And hopefully we'll be doing this again in the very near future and back on starting on Sunday in Phoenix. But one at a time tonight, then Friday, hopefully Friday in L.A. For AD Antonio Daniels, I'm Joel Myers. Thank you for joining us and get a win tonight.